Building a Stuart 504 boiler plant, part 25. Completing the assembly of the steam plant, making the drive pulley and drive belt, and testing the generator. If you've been following this series, you will then realise how tedious it was to lag all these pipes. This pipe lagging is not so much to keep the heat in, it's to stop you from burning your fingers on the live steam feed pipes from the boiler. That's why not all the pipes have the lagging on them, that would look stupid. Underneath the 504 boiler are a selection of tubes. Most of these are water tubes. You just carry water from the boiler and that gives you a greater surface area to heat the water. But the centre pipe is a superheater. So really the steam comes out of the boiler, passes back through the fire and then back up to the main steam tap on top of the boiler. So the steam coming out of this tap is very hot indeed and you would burn yourself badly if you touched a pipe that was connected immediately to this steam supply. So that's where the pipe lagging comes in. I suppose there is some thermal efficiency involved, but it's very little. It's really to just stop you burning your fingers by touching a pipe that is extremely hot. In this clip, I'm using some emulsion paint on a small brush to just touch in the piping where I miss some bits. This is the main steam feed to the engine from the turret. And once again, this is superheated steam. And before any viewers point out, well, the turret's got superheated steam in it, so why aren't you lagging that as well? Well, to be fair, it would look very stupid wrapped in string. A far better idea is to wrap me in string. That way I can touch anything that's hot without getting burnt. Now that is something that I may make a video about. And the series could be called Mummification for Beginners. But seriously, I don't want to wrap everything in string. I do like a little bit of danger in my life because these days things have got very boring and very politically correct. So I like to live life on the edge. And once again, before any of the anally retentive viewers mention, oh, you've missed a bit of paint there too. Yes, I'm touching it in with a brush. I do like to get things as correct as possible, but sometimes, being a human being, not a machine, I do make mistakes. Why am I hitting this with the hammer? Well, it's the soft rubber-faced hammer that I bought recently. To initially tap the bearing into the half inch diameter hole, I use a socket. It's most important that you make sure that if you put any pressure on a bearing, you need to put the pressure on the outer ring, never the inner part. And once the bearing is approximately in the right position, I use the rubber faced hammer to knock in the brass retainer. So here is the full assembly. The shaft is in place, and I've just tightened the tooth belt onto the shaft. And I'm doing it a second time, using a barco spanner to apply a little bit more pressure to the Allen key, but be very careful when you do this, because the last thing you want to happen is for the Allen key to shear off inside the Allen grub screw. It's most important that the wiring doesn't contact any part of the woodwork or the motor, so I'm doing it this way. It may look a little bit crude, but it works. And this connector is big enough to take the ends of both sets of diodes. With my electric drill spinning the counter shaft, the generator is giving an output of 6.4 volts. Here's a good tip. I'm using my electric drill to twist two pieces of wire together. It's a really quick and easy way to do it, and much quicker than doing it by hand. And I need this piece of wire to temporarily connect the voltage converter to the generator output connector. So here's the finished twisted piece of wire, and here it is connected to the voltage converter. And now when I spin up the counter shaft with the electric drill, I'm getting 6.51 volts at the voltage converter's input. When I press the button, I can adjust the output. So I'm going to adjust the output to 12 volts. This seems a little bit like witchcraft. 6 volts goes in and 12 volts comes out. I'm sure there are going to be losses, but this is not going in the box with the generator. This is going to be in a separate box with a lot of connectors. When I bought the drive belt for the generator, I bought a spare one. And I found these clips that came off a light fitting. So I'm screwing these into the bottom of the box and I'll build to support a spare belt like this. So it's not going to fall off, but it's always going to be there for easy replacement. And before moving on to the next part of the video, I really would like to apologize to Jamie who sent me the voltage converter. He's from Canada, not from the USA. Time to sit back and relax and watch me make an aluminium pulley. This is the smallest piece of aluminium that I had in the workshop. It's a little bit big and I'm having to turn quite a lot of it down. The finished diameter of the pulley, where the drive belt's going to fit, needs to be three quarters of an inch in diameter. 
So I'm setting that on the micrometer and that gives me some idea of how much metal I need to remove. I've turned the piece of aluminium round in the chuck, just in case you hadn't noticed, and I'm machining the other end. I don't want this pulley to look big and clumsy, so in this clip I'm using the leather drive belt, which will tell me how much metal I have to leave on each end, to act as a guide for the drive belt. In case you think I've gone mad, well sometimes I'm a little bit illogical, but I'm turning down the front to remove quite a lot of the material to take it down to approximately three quarters of an inch. Then I reverse it in the chuck, after measuring it to make sure it's correct. And at this stage of the operation, I've rotated the carbide tip on the cutting tool, so now I have a nice new cutting tool which will give me a good finish. And now by using the leather belt again, you can see exactly how much I need to take off. I still need to reduce the outside diameter. The flanges at the end of the pulley need to end up about one inch in diameter. Now it's time to fit a parting tool to cut the pulley to its final size. This part of the sequence is really speeded up, so I could get through it quickly. I'm machining the inside of this pulley down to three quarters of an inch, and that's why you keep seeing the micrometer coming in and out of the shot. I'm also using the drive belt to gauge the width of the pulley, and eventually I get the pulley to the right size. In this clip, I'm reducing the outer diameter of the flanges. And now the exciting part, I'm making a hole down the middle of the pulley. The pulley's been in the chuck all the time, so this is going to be quite an accurate component. First of all I centre drill it, then I drill it with a twist drill, and the twist drill is one imperial size under what I require, so it's one imperial size under a quarter of an inch. And if you need to know what that is, just google imperial drill sets and have a look at the drill set. I don't bother working out the maths of it, I just look at the drill set, and the drill set tells me what the drill sizes are, and I just select one imperial size less than the finished hole size that I want. So where are we? Oh yes, I've parted off the finished pulley, I've reversed it in the chuck, and I'm holding it very lightly by the edges of the flanges, and I'm just machining off the front of it. Very fine cuts are the order of the day, it's only held by the flanges. The rest is pretty routine. Using a ruler, I measure to the centre, I drill a hole in the centre with a centre drill, and then I drill it with an eighth of an inch diameter drill, which is tapping size for 4BA, then I thread it 4BA, and that's after brushing the part with some white spirit to act as a lubricant. And the tapping operation shown here is speeded up by 300%. I'm applying a tiny bit of lubricant to the shaft where it goes into the brass part. The shaft runs in a ball race, so I'm not applying the oil to that, I'm just applying it to the brass part, because the pulley may occasionally touch the brass part and I don't want it to get scored. To make the belt, I just chamfer each end on the belt sander, one end on the inside and one end on the outside to make like a scarf joint, and I join the belt using some cyanoacrylate adhesive, or CA glue, or super glue. This method of assembling leather drive belts seems to work very well. I had thought of making a hinge system. On my old Smart and Brown lathe, the main spindle is driven by a flat belt, and it has a special fitting with a pin going through it, which allows for a very easy removal and refitting of a new belt. One problem that I thought I was going to have was with the friction on the actual pulley. Aluminium is quite slippery as far as metal goes and just as I thought, the belt was slipping on the pulley. Because of the internal gearing up of the generator, when I put the generator under load, the pulley started to slip. I did consider using a knurling tool on the pulley, but I thought that was a bit severe and it would wear the belt. So instead, I'm using some silicone o-rings. These are some metric o-rings I bought a while back, and they're just good for general purpose usage. I don't actually use them as piston rings, but I do need to go up to Blackgates and get some that are thinner, because these are a bit bulky and a bit thick, and I used to have a girlfriend like that. So here's the steam plant running on compressed air. The belt is turning the pulley, the pulley is turning the countershaft, the countershaft is turning the generator, and it's not over noisy. Time to test the output of the generator. This is via the voltage converter, and it seems to work. Let there be light. I'm initially testing the generator using a 21 watt bulb. The steam engine is running quite slowly and the bulb is lighting fairly brightly. 
but do bear in mind that my workbench is under quite a lot of LED light, very bright lights for the video. Oh, and by the way, for the viewer who took the trouble to write in and criticise the colour of my cup of tea, that was due to the amount of light on the subject, plus the colour correction in the editor. After running the generator for a while, I thought I'd have a quick look inside and see if everything was OK, and everything was fine, the voltage converter still in the same place because I put some double-sided tape underneath it. As I mentioned earlier though, the only thing that's going to be underneath this steam plant is the generator and the mechanics that drive it. There will just be a positive and negative wire comes out of the unit, which will go to the control box. And I'll be making this very shortly when some parts arrive. But for the moment, I'll leave you with the generator running, and it's running quite sweetly. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. <laughs>